<laughs> Just gonna have some water real quick. So, water is a pretty incredible and interesting substance. It's the only substance that is found naturally on Earth in three different forms, liquid, solid, and gas. It always finds the path of least resistance, and for humans, that's not necessarily a good thing. But I was on that path of least resistance for a long time, until I found stoicism. But let me back up a little bit. So, my parents moved from Korea, South Korea, to Montreal when I was three years old. And then when I was eight, I moved to Port Moody, which is a suburb of Vancouver, if you're unfamiliar with it. French was my second language after Korean, um, and my parents didn't want me to lose it, so I went to French immersion. And I was always different. I was the only Asian kid in school, and uh, because of that, I think I developed a few quirks. Um, I always thought I was kind of weird and I didn't fit in. Uh, my parents were extremely controlling, like unbelievably so. By the age of five, I had two career choices, according to them. I could be a doctor, surprise, surprise, <laughs> or the Prime Minister of Canada. <laughs> Trudeau, I'm coming goodness. for you. Yeah. <laughs> so I didn't have a great childhood. Um, like I said, my parents were very controlling, and I was very sheltered because of that. Um, it developed a lot of interesting character traits, like social anxiety, as Mark mentioned. Um, I was very close-minded, and I thrived in the comfort zone. I never wanted to leave that comfort zone. I was always in fear. Um, when I got to high school, high school was high school. It was, it was interesting. Um, but by my senior years, when my back, was against, my back was against the wall, and I had to get into university, I really hunkered down and got my studies in order, and for the first time, I kind of excelled. And I got into UBC with a scholarship into sciences to start a new life. But this wasn't a life that I chose for myself. This was what my parents wanted me to study. And when I got there, it was, it was tough. I had this newfound freedom that I didn't know how to handle at all. I never had freedom up to this point. All of a sudden, I could go out whenever I wanted. And that, coupled with a disinterest in my studies, was not a great combination. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I didn't do very well in my first two years of studies. I actually failed, miserably so, in my second year. Uh, Bio 200, I'm pretty sure this is a record, but I never looked into it. I graduated, or my, my final grade for Bio 200 was 9%. I didn't go to a single, <laughs> true story. I didn't go to a single class and I wrote the final. I don't even know how I got the 9%. But anyways, 48% average meant that I had to withdraw from my studies. Um, I lost my identity for the first time. I, I thought I was this studious student ready to become a doctor, but I had to retreat, I went to Douglas College, and I had to upgrade my courses so that I could get back into university. But this time, I was gonna do it on my own terms. I wanted to study what I wanted to study. And at the time, because I grew up in the suburbs, I think cash ruled everything around me, and money was my primary focus. I thought if I got into economics, which I actually intrinsically enjoyed studying, if I got into economics, I could get a high-paying job and have a good career. I got back into UBC, um, and I took two electives that completely changed my life forever. Um, I took psychology and I took sociology. Psychology was incredible. It was like therapy. Every class I went to, I found definitions of what was wrong with me and how I could work <laughs> through them. It was pretty incredible. Sociology was also incredible because growing up in the suburbs, I was very close-minded. I was kind of a sheep. And sociology unplugged me from the matrix. All of a sudden, I could look behind face value and, and see things for the way they really were. See how people were trying to manipulate you, either positively or negatively. At the same time, around this time, I, uh, I got a job at a clothing boutique. Uh, it was a high-end ethical clothing boutique, and I thought I found my new passion and my calling. Um, I found a passion for fashion, and I excelled in, in this position. I quickly became the buyer, the store manager, and then I started traveling the world, buying clothing for, for the store. Through this experience, I got to go to a lot of expensive, extravagant restaurants, which I never had exposure to in my previous life. Through that, I developed this big love of food, and all of a sudden, this food 
this passion for food was consuming. It eventually turned into my love of cooking, but that took a little while. Through this experience studying economics, psych, and sociology, I developed a passion for lifelong learning. So on my time off, I would study entrepreneurship. I would study small business management, marketing, life satisfaction, what it means for us to be fulfilled in life and what provides us that feeling. I quickly developed a disconnect between my career in fashion and my new set of values. I wanted to value experiences, not material goods. At the time, I was selling people things, really expensive things, that in the end they didn't really need. And that wasn't vibing well with my mental health. Thankfully, I found that new passion of food, and it really consumed me. I would get off work, I'd be on the bus on the way back from UBC, and I'd be head down in a book. I was ordering a book every week to read and study. I wasn't just looking at recipes, I was trying to figure out what created synergies between different ingredients, what made something taste good. I used my knowledge that I was learning from psychology to figure out how to give someone an experience rather than a meal. Through this, I developed a, a keen sense of practice. I remember one time I went to Costco, bought a giant bag of onions, and went home and sliced them all up. And it took a long time. I don't know how I didn't cut myself, but that was the kind of thing I did to, to teach myself this craft. Um, throughout this period, I was still working through a lot of the bad habits and I would say negative mindsets that I accumulated through my formative years. And I had a, lot of, a long way to go. I never meant for cooking to become my, my career, but I had left my clothing boutique and I started doing marketing and something was missing. I had a side hustle, um, it was my passion, and I started doing pop-ups around the city and people were gaining, uh, it was gaining a lot of notoriety. Luis, if you know him through his handle when they find us on Instagram, he approached me and said, hey, there's a group of creatives I want you to cook for. I'll come and document it and we can use the pictures for whatever we want. I totally said yes, I jumped to that idea and it went really well. It was some of the most beautiful pictures I had ever seen and they were of me and my food. We used that and posted on social media. After being stuck on social media at about 700 followers for like a year, I think in the span of three weeks, we went to 2,000 followers and it was life-changing. Companies started taking note uh, the first company to reach out to us was Red, which is Bono's charity. They were doing a charity week, um, primarily in New York, but it was a global thing. And I was to do the only dinner in Vancouver that year. I did that, and then that gave me even more press. Then we went on to do Kit and Ace. At the time, they were starting up and they wanted to make a big splash in the scene, so they started inviting some of the most noteworthy creatives around town to come in for dinner, and they'd invite a local chef to cook for them. The two chefs that preceded me, I was the third one, the two chefs that preceded me were Andrew Carlson from Burdock and & Co. and uh, David Gunawan of Farmer's Apprentice. Two of the chefs I idolized completely. I was in love with them and to follow them I was incredibly nervous. Somehow we pulled it off and we did such a great job that to this day we're the only chef, or we're the only team that was invited to cook twice. That went really well and then Kinfolk Magazine came out and reached out to do one of their uh, Kinfolk Gathering dinners. All of this started to build momentum. 33 Acres reached out to me after we did Hawker's Market together, and we were the two busiest stalls, but they cheated. They had beer, and no one else did. <laughs> we were the two busiest, and uh, Dustin, the manager, reached out. Their Monday nights were a bit slow, so he said, hey, do you want to do a Monday night pop-up series, which you might have seen? I definitely said yes to that, and it was crazy. I came from struggling to find my calling and to figure out what I was going to do in life to having lineups down the block in Mount Pleasant, waiting, people waiting to have my food. It was the start to a new life I couldn't have even dreamt of. We started winning awards. We started getting invites to all sorts of exclusive events. We were being written up in publications. Film producers were coming up to us, asking us to produce food for the scenes in their movie. Magazines started asking us to do spreads for their recipes in the next issue. Consulting gigs came. Life was really great, on, on the surface. But after a few months, 
when the initial excitement died down a bit, it got to the point where I started realizing that I never did end up finishing that progress I was making. I never finished working on myself and developing myself personally. This was a big issue. When I got to the point where we were so busy, I didn't know how to handle the success. I had imposter syndrome. I went from being someone who had very low self-esteem at times to having all this attention on me all of a sudden. I wasn't used to it. I was a very private person. Remember, I grew up thinking I was really weird. And all of a sudden, my whole life was on social media. Everyone could see every move that I was making. I started eating for pleasure, not for health. I started drinking every day. I was constantly burnt out. I didn't prioritize sleep. I started smoking at my worst. And I developed this big need to become a workaholic. All I cared about was work. Through the negative, point, the negative points, we never, our work never faltered. It was more so that we prioritized our work over everything, including my health, my well-being, my mental health. I stopped meditating. I stopped this lifelong, journey, lifelong learning journey that I started. I forgot everything that helped me get to this point of success. I stopped social media. If you actually go back to my feed, there's at one point where I just completely stopped responding to comments. I couldn't spend that time looking at my work. Then, I think it was the summer of 2017, I stopped posting on social media. And when you're someone who posts on social media a lot, and that's where all of your business comes from, people start questioning what, what's going on. Friends would be coming up to me like, hey, are you okay? Like, where'd you go? It was interesting, the reaction. And at that point, I knew I was having trouble, but I didn't think I was in a low. I, I didn't think I was having that big of an issue. Four years of this roller coaster ride of sadness, addictions, severe burnout, interspersed with success and genuine happiness at times. It all came to a head in 2017. I remember we had an especially busy holiday season. Uh, the demand for our services was greater than ever. The last event of the year happened, and I remember going home and crashing down, sitting on my couch, and I can't even put into words how I felt. It was despair and agony, and I didn't want to do this anymore. I completely lost my identity. I found a calling as a chef, and I thrived in that for four years. But all of a sudden, sitting on that couch, I vowed to never step into a kitchen again, professionally. I sat there thinking about who I had become. I hated my life. I hated myself. I didn't have time to treat friends with genuine respect and love. I was very short with everyone, didn't respond to text messages, didn't respond to messages on Instagram. January 1st came, and um, I knew I had to stop smoking. That one was very clear. So January 1st, made a resolution, I would stop smoking. I hate resolutions, by the way, but I thought it was a good time to stop smoking. At this point, I was escaping my reality whenever I could. This was happening throughout my life, throughout my career. I would constantly look to medicate this negative feeling I had. I didn't know what to do with it. Leaving the kitchen was interesting. I had to figure out a new line of work. Um, so I developed digital photography, which I had some experience with, with my own uh, Instagram account. But I, I decided to actually buy a physical digital camera and start doing social media marketing for restaurants. I would use the connections I've made, the knowledge and skills I developed to, to do a really good job promoting other people's work. I thought I found my way out. We picked up two clients. They were both in Gastown. One was called Tempranillo, and one was called Pigeon. Uh, Tempranillo is not there anymore. It wasn't my fault. It was, uh, <laughs> they, uh, someone bought the building and there was, le it wasn't my fault. Uh, <laughs> Pigeon was a blessing in disguise. Um, Brandon Grisuti, the owner of Pigeon, he had known me for a couple years before I started working for him. And he knew something was wrong, but he knew better than to have an intervention or anything like that. Instead, he would encourage me to come and go to the gym with him. He would do that all the time, and I would respond with, yeah, for sure. Sarcastically, I, would, I never went. <laughs> then, in March, 
I decided I would go. Why not? What did I have to lose? For the first time in, I think, two years, and two years before that, it was like a month of working out, and then I stopped. But the first time in two years, I went to a gym, worked out. I was sore for two weeks. I couldn't move. But when that soreness went away, I went again. And then I went again. And then after that, I went again. And I started feeling different. I started feeling these small positive changes happening. And I knew better. I mean, I studied psychology. I know the effects of physical exercise on mental health and well-being. That started motivating me to start fixing other areas of my life. My nutrition was terrible. You can't even imagine what I was eating. I started to, I started to eat a little better to fuel my workouts, which then translated to me wanting to sleep better to help me recover from those workouts. So I realized the alcohol consumption, which was almost daily for years, that alcohol consumption was really ruining my sleep. I couldn't get into deep REM cycles no matter how hard I tried. Going from four to six hours a week, or four to six hours a day of sleep to eight hours a day without alcohol was life-changing. I suddenly had clarity. I was able to focus. My brain fog started slowly going away. That led to me going sober, which led to me cutting out sugar, processed foods. I started eating extremely healthy six and a half days out of the week. I still have a cheat meal once in a while, but I always made sure that the foundation of my nutrition was supporting this new positive feeling and this positive energy that I want to have. That was me at my uh, heaviest, which isn't that bad, I know, but that's 30 pounds overweight. And uh, quickly, in about the span of six months, I was able to reduce that down. Chef Jefferson Alvarez is in the crowd right now, and he came in and he said, you're so skinny now. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Told him he had to listen to the talk. Um, around this time, I get an email. Uh, Ali Wong is producing a movie in Vancouver, and we want you to produce the food for the movie. Now, we've worked on many TV shows and movies before, so this wasn't anything new, but it was an interesting challenge. It was a very food-centric movie, and all of a sudden I was in this negative headspace with wanting to be in the, not wanting to be in the kitchen, but this was exciting to me, and I kind of wanted to get back in there. So I enlisted the help of my mentor, Chris Barnholden, who's in the crowd, and uh, Chris uh, assisted me in helping train Ali for the movie, as well as producing a lot of the food for the movie. Um, that new sense of purpose, coupled with this new change in my lifestyle, was life-changing. I suddenly had purpose, motivation, drive. I had a healthy way of living. This avalanche a whole area of self-growth that I never got to. I, I did meditate before, but I took my meditation a lot more seriously than I ever have. I started forest bathing. Forest bathing is going into a forest and just clearing your mind and being really present and in the moment of your surroundings. That immersion in nature was life-changing for my mental health. I started to listen to podcasts again. I started to read again. I started to go on audiobooks or listen to audiobooks. I would go one and a half times speed so I can consume them even faster. It got addicting. I was consuming like five books a day at a time. I started developing habits from everything I was learning. I developed keystone habits. I started developing rituals for my life. I started to dictate who I was as a person through my actions rather than my words or my thoughts. That's when I realized that creativity and well-being are very interconnected. At my worst, I was having trouble coming up with new dishes, new menus, but all of a sudden, the creative juices were flowing, and all of a sudden I was inspired in the kitchen again. I could go to the farmer's markets because it didn't remind me of work anymore, which would give me anxiety attacks in the past. I could go to farmer's markets and be excited about the beautiful produce. It was springtime at that time. That was the first dish I created after, I believe, six months of not having created a new dish. Um, you could really see that it was an expression of color and, and joy that I had so much trouble finding in the past. The biggest, the biggest lesson I learned through all this was that improving your well-being in a sustainable, 
holistic manner was the way to go. It had to be a long-term focus, not a short-term focus. I couldn't worry about the end result, but rather I had to focus on making sure the process was sound and that I found enjoyment in the process. Self-discipline is impossible when you're incredibly stressed out, burnt out, when you're sitting there escaping your reality through addictions. There's no way you have self-discipline to do anything positive. I quickly figured out that I was to I, I had to figure out a way to automate my self-discipline. I needed to find an overarching philosophy to guide my decision-making. And for me, that was Stoicism. Stoicism, previously, before I encountered it, I thought it was a purposeful um, aversion of pleasure, and I thought it was... Stoicism, I thought, was looking at whatever happens to you with zero emotion. I mean, that's... Partly true, but not really. Stoicism really is about virtue, tolerance, and self-control guided by wisdom and knowledge. It's, like I said, worrying about the process, not the end result. It's about taking the emotions out of decision-making. The Greek word for emotions is pathos, which is derivative of pathogen, or pathogen is derivative of pathos, I should say. Uh, which is disease. They really thought that emotions led to people acting irrationally. It was one of the first forms of emotional intelligence that I encountered in a philosophy. That was something I learned in psychology, the importance of emotional intelligence and how we should be teaching our kids emotional intelligence. Instead of trying to build a perfect society, a Stoic will take into account the current state of affairs. The key message is to control your pleasures so that you can live without them. If something wants to happen and you, lose, and you lose your possessions, there shouldn't be suffering there. You should learn to accept where you are and thrive. Concerning myself with what I could control and not worrying about things I couldn't, like public perception, for example, really helped me get out of that negative mindset I was in. Now, wisdom and knowledge comes from critical thinking especially in this misinformation age we are in, where everyone's trying to sway your beliefs for their personal gain. Whether it's a politician or a fitness influencer, they're trying to convince you to do something. You have to learn how to learn. And thankfully, my psychology taught me that. I learned how to be a skeptic. I learned how to look past the, the face value of a study and look at whether it had relevance due to its methodology or whether they had an ulterior motive of wanting to say that some variable causes this result. If you look at social media and smartphones, for example, they're not designed for our well-being in mind. They're designed for one thing, for them to be profitable. They're designed to be as addictive as possible. And for me, I suffered through that. I was addicted to social media at one point and addicted to my smartphone, but eventually, my aversion of work disconnected me from the two, and then I could see the negative aspects of the, t of the incredible tools they are, but I could see the negative aspects and what it was doing to not only myself, but to the people around me. As technology evolves, this is going to happen more and more, and it's our duty, no one's gonna do it for us, but it's our duty to really figure out how to make those tools serve us, not the other way around. Now, stoicism, was instrumental in me fixing my mental health. Epictetus once said, we suffer not from the events in our lives, but rather from our judgments of them. It was how I was framing everything that was happening in my life through my career that was putting me in this mental health gutter I was in. Now, I don't have time to get into in depth with tips and how to's of how to get stoicism into your life, and stoicism might not be the framework that works best for you but I think it's really valuable to explore it for yourself. Everyone's concerned these days about a rebrand, whether it's for your business or for your personal brand. But I think we should all take a moment to perform a deep introspective rebrand, to change what's inside. I think personal change is one of the hardest things we can do, but I truly believe that it can make us happier, more resilient, and more creative in the end. If water is a necessity for our survival, Creativity is a necessity for our souls. Creativity is highest when we are optimized, when we are our best selves. And I believe that's the true value of creative pursuits. It pushes us to constantly strive for that 
for that excellence in well-being. If you're going to take away one thing, be more like water. Be fluid. Adapt in this environment we're in. Don't fight your environment, but rather learn to thrive in the circumstances you're given. Then, and only then, can you make a positive impact in the world we live in. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Joanne Probin, and uh, I'm really curious how your, uh, um, your life, all your decisions, where you are today, how is that um, infused into the decision-making while you're uh, creating food? So um, your creative process, how is that reflected um, in the results of, of the food that you create, of, be that visually or a philosophy in your, in your uh, preparations? So it's funny, when I first started cooking, I said everything I did previous to my life led me to this point. And similar to water, I absorbed everything I came into contact with. And um, first was um, my experience with psychology. And so I learned that I could provide experiences, not just food. It was more than that. And I think that led to a lot of my success. Also, my time, um, my time in uh, the clothing store was instrumental. Um, I was surrounded by artists for the first time in my life. So I was seeing all these different art forms and being inspired by them. I started to figure out, I, and I wasn't good at this when I first started working there, but I started figuring out like why certain silhouettes and, and pieces and colors and textures look good with certain people and it doesn't with others, which that led to me being able to look at a plate and look at different textures of ingredients and being able to put those together. Um, my experience with, so my liberal arts degree, um, I really think the biggest strength is that you can view an issue from multiple perspectives. And I think that's what, the, the real value of a liberal arts degree is. And, and so I think everything I, I studied in, in education led to that. Um, also being a big fan of really great graphic design, like I personally am not that great at it, but I love looking at really great graphic design. Um, you know, going to art galleries and looking at paintings, um, all sorts of things. And then eventually when cooking became my craft, everything was viewed through that lens. So um, I remember being in the forest at Pacific Spirit Park one time, and there was like a log that fell over, and there was moss growing on it. And uh, on the moss, there was uh, neat pine needles and, and different things that fell on it. And it l legitimately looked like an artist placed it perfectly there. And so I remember looking at that, and that actually inspired me. I don't know if you remember, there was a slide where I created like a moss landscape with rocks and stuff that inspired that uh, installation piece. So, yeah, everything everything I come into contact with, kind of, Thank you. yeah. Hi. Um, oh, that's really loud. Great talk, by the way. It was lots of fun to see all the pictures. Uh, my name is Mac. Question for you. Now, you're not, at least not currently, the Prime Minister of Canada. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet, exactly. Not currently. That could change. Um, what, uh, if this is emotionally available to you, what do your parents think of your current career choice? Ooh, getting personal. Um, <laughs> got a couch, Mark? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, um, it's funny because they, they always gave me a hard time and um, I think that actually led to a lot of my unhappiness throughout my life. I never thought I was enough. I never thought I was, uh, I, I never thought I was good enough. And um, eventually I started, when I started internalizing that I wanted to stop what people thought and I had to make my own decisions. They were the first people that I kind of mentally had to cut off and be like, I don't really care what they think. Um, that being said, I remember I invited them uh, to, th or I, I actually have to mention, I told my mom one time that I wanted to uh, start catering. And she said that it was so risky and that I shouldn't do it and that it was not a good idea and that having a business is harder than you think. Like, I know, mom. <laughs> and. Um, Anyway, so I did, and then 33 Acres, when that happened, I invited them to the first one, and I could tell they were proud of me, for sure. And um, yeah, I think they were finally happy to see, they saw the demand that was there, and they were finally happy to see that, you know, I found something that, yeah, that was good. 
Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Paul LeBlanc. Thanks for that. That was terrific. Thank you. Um, an epiphany story, which I, I think yours kind of is, about sort of getting through something and, and getting to something better, reminds me a little bit of a romantic comedy movie. You have these two crazy kids with all these obstacles, <laughs> and then finally, at the end, they get together, day one of the new relationship, the end. <laughs> and you're pretty young. <laughs> <laughs> Love where this is going. <laughs> Um, maybe you'll get stuck again, yeah, or you know, sure. uh, maybe you'll want to do something else. Do you think if you came back in five years, you're, you're in a position where you can tell the story and it'd still be a positive thing? Yeah. So it's funny. Uh, I so I started that that transformation um, about yeah about a year ago. Holy crap! So it was about a year ago that I did that. Um, I've always been part of like this binge culture we're part of, and and one thing that I always binged on, I went on health binges. Like I knew what it meant to live a healthy lifestyle. And so I would binge on that health. But I always framed it in my mind in such a poor way. Like I wanted to see results and I was so results oriented. And I was like, if I was going to the gym, like I want to see results in a month. And this time it was like, I lost everything. And so I had nothing else to lose. I, had, I didn't give a shit what I looked like, anything. So all of a sudden this was now framed with stoicism. And so it was all about the process and creating creating habits and rituals and making, focusing on that and finding an enjoyment out of that instead of trying to get somewhere with either my health or my sleep or my nutrition. And so I think that's what's different. This is the longest period I've ever gone in a, in a very um, healthy, well-being focused manner. So this is the best I've done so far in my life. So I'm sure I'll have slips and falls along the way, but hopefully still is some March, kind of keeps March me in line. 2024. <laughs> I'll be back. We know who our speaker is going to be. Uh, anybody in the back? Okay, over here. Uh, actually, let's go here. Go here, and then we'll go over there. Hey, Gina, thanks. Um, I'm Michelle. I wanted to say thank you for bursting the creative or the bubble of the necessity to have pain to be creative. Um, Devil's advocate, do you think you would be able to find or have the success you do now without having to kill yourself first? And if not, do you have some people that you see or that you know of that have been able to do it well? Wow, great question. Um, when I was writing this, I actually thought a lot about that. Um, sorry, could you repeat the first question again? <laughs> um, if you... Oh, right, 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 I got it, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was struggling with that thought when I wrote this because I'm like, I wonder if, because I'm, I'm like telling, I'm saying that stoicism can help people uh, perform better, but is that pain a necessity to find that, you know, you have nothing to lose and then that's what enables you to be successful? I'm not quite sure what the answer to that is, but I think it, it depends on the person. I think it depends on the environment you grew up in, and that is interlaced with the genetics you have and your predispositions. Um, I think everyone, everyone's wired differently, and I think it will be, um, I think it's a challenge for everyone, but I don't think pain is a necessity. I'm not quite sure if I, I needed that pain to get there, but it definitely sped it up a bit. Yeah. What was your second question again? <laughs> Oh, I'm going to say no, because I think like not everyone is very transparent. And so sometimes there's struggles that you just don't see. And especially with social media these days, you just assume when you see people who are, you know, beautiful and they have beautiful photography of them and their kids and, and everything, like you just assume things, but you don't know what happens behind the scenes. And and so, yeah, there's, I don't think there's a way I could answer that. But I do want to address that in the food industry in particular, there's a lot of issues with mental health. And I see a lot of progress happening these days. Um, there's an article that came out on Bon Appetit from the owner of Joe Beef, David McMillan. Um, and I read it and I was like, wow, like I'm about to give a talk about my journey. And he laid it out and it was very vulnerable. And he was talking about his addictions and, it was pretty intense to read, but there's more people coming out and vocalizing that, and there's more groups. Um, Mind the Bar, which is a local initiative, 
their whole thing is it's a nonprofit started by people in the industry, and the whole premise is that it's a safe place for industry people to talk to someone if they're um, workaholics or alcoholics or if they're having mental health issues, and Mind the Bar will kind of take care of the therapy that goes along with that. And I, final thing on that note, therapy, I think, is valuable for everyone. It's time that we really take away the stigma of, of it. It's like having a personal trainer, but for your mind, and it's nothing different from that. And I think the more people who address the issues and the inner turmoil that they have, I think the more happier and more effective they'll be. Do you know, can, is that uh, Joe Beef um, article online? Yeah. Can yeah. you send me a link and I'll share it with everybody? Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Uh, I think we're going to have last question, if that's okay. Um, has anybody got a really burning question they need to ask? They just really, okay, we're going to, you're going to be last question. Go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Curtis. Hi. From all your life lessons learned, what are your non-negotiables for personal career and your health now? Ooh. Uh, keystone habits, because for me, and like I said, everyone's different. This might not be what it is for you, but I found through my research that keystone habits were really um, important. And what keystone habits are, it's like making your bed in the morning. It's, it seems like it's something that's not important, so I never did it throughout my, the, the four years that I went through. Like I never did my bed once. Um, but when I start to realize why that's important, it, it defines who you are as a person. Like, oh, I'm someone who makes my bed every morning. And then if I'm going to the gym, let's say like I'm feeling ill, I'll still try to go and like I won't work out as hard, but it's like, oh, I'm someone who doesn't miss a workout. And then that becomes who you are. And then I think that's why to address Paul's point, like I think that's what helped me to, to become, like to create everlasting change. Um, whereas before it was like, yeah, I was just so focused on the end result and I'm just worried about the process and making sure that every day I do what's necessary for me to be who I want to be. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic um, talk. So I recently started a book that came out last week called Zucked about the inside of um, Facebook and <laughs> how manipulative and all that. And you've talked, yeah, touched on that. For sure. What is your relationship now with social media? <laughs> um, it's an interesting one because it's an invaluable tool to you know stay in contact with friends and and um, and to promote things that you want to promote. Um, personally, I try to limit my social media use. I uh, I try to like Facebook. I used to be on quite heavily, um, but the only time I ever go on Facebook is when I'm managing my clients and and doing you know work for them. Um, for Instagram, I I mean we we've been lucky to uh, never had to have it advertised, but Mark or er, Instagram is our uh, our sole form of communication. And so I think that's something that I neglected for a long time. And um, that I, I, if I want to evolve my business, which is what I'm currently doing, um, into other avenues other than just catering, um, that's something I'm going to have to maintain. But I think just always reminding yourself um, what you want out of it. Like having it, making sure that you frame it in your mind as a tool that you want to use that serves you and not the other way around. Um, I'm sure it's in your book, but the VP of user, user growth, I think, of Facebook came out and said that he felt tremendous guilt about um, creating the dopamine feedback loops of Facebook. But like that's what social media is like, right? They want you to be addicted. They want you to be on it all the time. And, and I think you have to look at what you have issues with. Like if you have issues with um, comparing yourself to others, like that's a bad one for social media. And you need to frame that in your mind differently so that you don't do that. Um, but, and if you're just addicted, like time addicted, and like you're not getting work done, that's a whole other issue, I think, outside of social media. But social media kind of aids that in happening. So yeah, I think um, for me, I, I just need to frame it to know that it's something positive as long as I keep it as something positive, yeah.